So at EHA this year, we will be, I will be virtually presenting data on a drug that uh, we are very excited about at MD Anderson, and I think in general in the United States as the data continues to mature. This is a uh, immunotherapy drug, a form of a macrophage checkpoint called uh, magrolumab. Uh, the way this agent works is that it blocks CD47 on the surface of the tumor cells. Now, CD47 usually uh, works in consort with SERP alpha on the surface of macrophages. And when you have CD47 on the tumor cell binding to SERP alpha on the macrophage, it actually shuts down the macrophage activity. So by blocking CD47, you are removing that inhibition on the macrophages, allowing them to do their function, which is to phagocytize the tumor cells, whether it's leukemia, lymphoma, or others. And you know the preclinical data for this agent is extremely robust, probably more than we have seen for any drugs uh, in, in cancer development in general, where we had very eloquent and uh, detailed preclinical analyses done by Dr. Majedi and Wiseman at Stanford along with their colleagues. And the study now is currently looking at frontline patients in AML MDS. So there are two presentations of the EHA meeting this year in 2020, both will be virtual. I will be presenting the AML frontline cohort and Dr. Salman, my colleague, will be presenting the frontline MDS cohort. So for the AML cohort, we're focusing on patients who are older and considered to be not suitable for induction chemotherapy. These are usually patients who have some underlying comorbidity, poor performance status, organ dysfunction, and would be considered to have a high risk of induction mortality based on the treating physician and the PI's opinion and that given site. Uh, so we have a total of uh, 29 patients that will be presented at the EHA meeting in this frontline AML cohort. This was based on the data cutoff, which was done in February. Uh, we do have more patients enrolled since then and will hopefully be updated at a future meeting. What's important to note is that all these patients are older than uh, 60, and the majority are above 70. The median age is 74, with a range from 62 all the way to 86. And more importantly, this is in general a patient with poor risk cytogenetics and high TP53 mutations. So we had about 72% patients with adverse cytogenetics per the ELN 2017 classification, and about 45% patients who had a TP53. Now, this is definitely higher than the general population, and partly this was intentional. We started seeing high responses and durable responses in TP53 AML, and so the study was actually amended about six to eight months, and all centers now are only enrolling frontline TP53 AML. Also, we know that Aza venetoclax does quite well in non-TP53 subsets in general, and so this is one of the other reasons to focus on TP53. So what we're seeing is response rates are high. What's already been reported is a CRCRI rate of about 60%, overall response rate about 65%, adding a few PRs and MLFS to the CRCRI. And uh, the safety profile to me is really what's uh, very uh, in encouraging with this agent. Uh, so we're not seeing any of the immune-related itis or toxicities that we are used to seeing with PD-1, CTLA-4, TIM-3. Uh, we haven't seen any significant, unexpected, prolonged neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, which is really quite nice, especially in this older, uh, unfit population. And uh, the main thing that we do see is that there is some early onset anemia. This is actually on target. Uh, CD47 in general uh, is not expressed heavily in normal tissue, but it is expressed on the surface of older red cells. And so when we do the initial intrapatient dose escalation, we do see that there is a clearance of the senescent red cells, and then these are replaced by reticulocytosis or younger red cells that are not susceptible to CD47. So usually within the first 10 to 14 days, we do see some anemia, we do have to do a few additional transfusions, and by day 14, this stabilizes and we don't have that problem again. But other than that, safety profile has been quite nice, very similar to azacidine alone, I would say. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the efficacy rates have been high, especially among TP53 mutated patients. We will be showing data. There are not that many patients at this time uh, that we can present the data, but we have 12 patients, frontline TP53 mutated AML, CRCRI rate is 75%, and at a median follow-up of about eight months, uh, we have not had a median duration response reached and the six month uh, estimated survival is about 90%. So this actually looks better 
than azacitine for sure, but actually also comparing cross trials, which has its caveats, does look better than what we have been used to seeing with azacitin minetoclax, where CR CRR rates are 50% or so duration of responses four to five months. Uh, so we will continue to enroll, especially for the frontline TP53. Uh, there are actually registrational approaches being discussed right now with the FDA and other regulatory authorities to see how we can um, move this forward in the frontline unsuitable for induction TP53 AML. And of course, a similar registrational phase three study is started already in MDS, intermediate high, very high IPSSR. This is called the enhanced study. Uh, and that phase three is about to open or already open in some sites in US and Europe. So all in all, we are hopeful and excited that we will continue to see very good safety and efficacy with this uh, agent mangrolumab plus azacitine. And really, I have focused on immunotherapy for a long time, and this really does seem to be the specific immunotherapy for AML. So we may not be uh, the same as solid tumors for PD-1, CTLA-4, and CD-47 may be the checkpoint that works in our group. Uh, we will see as the phase three studies continue. Thank you.